wasn't talking about your butt hair. Hey, how's it going, you fiends? I'm Demi Bobemi. And I'm dead inside, and welcome back to another Brisinger. Guess what, guys? Today, I'm not wearing my merch. But I am. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> wow. Maji day! Maji day. Maji day. <laughs> That's an inside joke to a comment somebody left me. <laughs> so Demi, tell us what's been going on in your life. Um, since we haven't been recording. Well, I guess we're only like one day behind. This should post tomorrow, so we should be good. Yeah, I mean, like for everyone else, I guess it doesn't really look like we've been gone forever. But I worked eight days in a row. And today's my first day off. Just. Really been working so much. You have an eyelash. I need to get it. Get it. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> Scared me. Look at it. Do I have to make a wish? Yeah. You can't waste it. <laughs> <laughs> Ew, why'd you eat it, you freak? I don't know. I just wanted to scare you. Demi, give us one of those glorious fucking recaps. God, it's been so long since I've heard a Demi recap. Recap? I'm fucking jonesing for it. Oh, One shit. minute? No, stop. Damn, dude. Stop. A whole minute? Oh. <laughs> so, Aragon's hanging out with the dwarves, and they said, we don't like you. And he said, you're really rude, but you wouldn't be if Saphir was here, because she's big and scary. And then he uh, talked to Oric, and Oric said, it's taken a long time, but not as long as I thought it would, or fucking something. And then he talked to the uh, crystal putter together people, said, can you put this together faster? And then they told him a story and they said, really wish we didn't have to, but we're doing it for you, you little shit. I don't really know. That's pretty, oh, don't restart. Stop, 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 stop. I feel like that's pretty much. Mm. It was just a lot of like, who should yeah. be the king? There's a lot of like, political stuff like oh we have to decide when we're ready if we're ready yeah. to decide on deciding about a king so we have to be ready to figure out if we're ready to figure out if we're ready if we're good and ready yeah if we're good and ready to have that king and or queen pretty yeah. much this second part of this chapter is going to be a lot better I oh. guarantee it I totally forgot <gasps> <laughs> Stop fucking with me. Okay. Um, Orc said that Aragon should die. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was how we ended it. Yeah. He's like, Aragon's like, I wish there was something I could do. And Orc's just like, You could die. <laughs> I am the black clad body of the AA. <laughs> oh my God. Fucking <laughs> calm down. <laughs> All right, let's fucking read this shit. Actually, it's not shit. It's actually been... I feel like the writing's been a lot better in that last chapter. Like, I didn't feel like it was, like, dragging on anywhere, mm -hmm. really. Like, I felt like it was moving at, like, a natural pace or, like, a good pace. And right. then I feel like the rest of this chapter will be moving at a similar pace. And I remember, I think, what happens in this chapter, and it seems very, very... Uh, or it's very, very, like, action-packed. Cool. Or not action-packed, but... Dude, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just trying not to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 31, Part 2, Blood on the Rocks. I felt pretty good. Nice, I like it. Thanks. Felt good. Early the next morning, Aragon sat with his back against the curved wall of the round room set deep below the center of Tronchim, along with a select group of warriors, advisors, servants, and family members of the clan chiefs who were privileged enough to attend the clan meet. The clan chiefs themselves were seated in heavy carved chairs arranged around the edge of a circular table, which, like most objects of note in the lower level of the city mountain, bore the crest of Corgan and the Injitum. At the moment, Galdheim, Grimst Borth of Der Grimst Feldunost, was speaking. He was short, even for a dwarf, hardly more than two feet in height. Okay. Jesus! And wore patterned robes of gold russet and midnight blue. Unlike the dwarves of, in, of the Injitum, he did not trim or braid his beard, and it tumbled across his chest like a tangled bramble. Standing on the seat of his chair, he pounded the polished table with his gloved fist and roared, Etta! 
Narho undum etolos isu vond. Narho undum etol os vorm men gons broxt os varden rask der grimstern garden. Hodden. Ah, jerk and dren. Quatred ne domer owen etol. I like that you corrected yourself as if it made a difference for any one of us. <laughs> No, Aragon's translator, a dwarf named Hunfast, whispered in his ear, I will not let that happen. I will not let these beardless fools, the Varden, destroy our country. The Dragon War left us weak and not... Aragon stifled a yawn, bored. Oh. I'm like, beardless? Have you met my cousin? He fingers his beard all the time. <laughs> He's always fingering his beard also. What a good insult, you beardless fool. I'm going to start calling people that. Beardless fool. You beardless fool. He allowed his gaze to drift around the granite table, from Galdheim to Nado, a round-faced dwarf with flaxen hair who was nodding with approval at Galdheim's thundering speech, to Havard, who was using a dagger to clean under the, fing under the fingernails of two remaining fingers on his right hand, to Vermund, heavy-browed, but otherwise inscrutable behind his purple veil, to Ganel and Unden, who sat leaning toward each other, whispering, while Hadolf Hadfala, while Hadfala, an elderly dwarf woman, who was a clan chief of Durgrimst Eberdak, and the third member of Ganel's alliance, frowned at the sheaf of rune-covered parchment she brought with her to every meeting, and then to the chief of Durgrimst Ledwanu, Mandrath, who sat in profile to Aragon, displaying his long, drooping nose to good effect. Thought to thought Thordris, Grimstborth of de Grimst Nagra, of whom he could see little but her wavy auburn hair, which fell past her shoulders and lay coiled on the floor in a braid twice as long as she was tall, to the back of Oryx's head as he slouched to one side in his chair. To free Owen, Grimstborth of de Grimst Gedthral, an immensely corpulent dwarf, who kept his eyes fixed upon the block of wood he was busy carving into the likeness of a hunched raven, and then to Hredarmar, Grimst Borth of der Grimst Urzhad, who, in contrast with Friowin, was fit and compact with corded forearms, and who wore a male hauberk and helm to every gathering, and finally to Iroun, she of the nut-brown skin marred only by a thin, crescent-shaped scar high upon her left cheekbone, she of the satin she of the satin bright hair bound underneath, a silver helm wrought in the shape of a snarling wolf's head, she of the vermilion dress and the necklace of flashing emerald set in the squares of gold carved with lines of arcane runes. Why did it all of a sudden change, like, the way everything was being said? I don't know, but also when he, like, describes these colors, I feel like he just picked words that sounded good with each other, but, like, really fucking vermilion and emerald. It's bright ass red and green. Why would why are you Christmas picking... colors? And then when he's like gold russet and midnight blue, russet's like brown, gold brown and blue. They sound like Keebler elves to me. <laughs> <clears throat> Ira Un noticed Aragon looking at her. A lazy smile appeared on her lips. With voluptuous ease, she winked at Aragon, obscuring one of her almond-shaped eyes for a pair of heartbeats. Oh, yeah, she's going to try to suck his toes. <laughs> <laughs> Aragon's cheeks stung as blood suffused them, and the tips of his ears burned. He shifted his gaze and returned it to Galdheim, who was still busy pontificating, his chest <laughs> puffed out like that of a strutting pigeon. I just imagine him just kind of, like, looking around, and then he, like, just so happens to look at Irun mm -hmm. as she's, like, like, notices him looking around, and then she's just like, and then he's like, <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, face is flushed and his ears get red. Love it. As Oric had asked, Aragon remained impassive throughout the meeting, concealing his reactions from those who were watching. When the clan meet broke for their midday meal, he hastened over to Oric, and bending so that no one could hear, said, Do not look for me at your table. I've had my fill of sitting and talking. I'm going to explore the tunnels for a bit. Oric nodded, appearing distracted, and murmured in reply, do as you wish, only be sure that you are here when we resume. It would not be meet for you to play truant, no matter how tedious these talks be. As you say, Aragon edged out of the conference room along with the press of dwarves eager to have their lunches and rejoined his four guards in the hallway outside, where they had been playing dice with idle warriors from other clans. 
With his guards in tow, Aragon struck out in a random direction, allowing his feet to carry him where they would while he pondered methods of welding the dwarves' contentious factions into a hole united against Galbatorix. To his exasperation, the only methods he could envision were so far-fetched it was absurd to imagine that they might succeed. Aragon paid little attention to the dwarves he met in the tunnels, aside from the mumbled greetings that courtesy occasionally demanded, nor even to his exact surroundings, trusting that Kvistor could guide him back to the conference room. Although Aragon did not study his surroundings in any great detail visually, he kept track of the minds of every living creature he was able to sense within a radius of several hundred feet, even down to the smallest spider crouched behind its web in the corner of a room. For Aragon had no desire to be surprised by anyone who might have caused to seek him out. When at last he stopped, he was surprised to find himself in the same dusty room he had discovered during his wanderings the previous day. To his left were the same five black arches that led to caverns unknown while there to his right was the same base relief base relief bass relief bass relief bass relief yeah probably bass relief bass relief carving of the head and shoulders of a snarling bear bemused by the coincidence aragon sauntered over to the bronze sculpture and gazed up at the bear's gleaming fangs gleaming fangs wondering what had drawn him back After a moment, he went to the middle of the five archways and gazed through it. The narrow hallway beyond was devoid of lanterns and soon faded into the soft oblivion of shadow. Reaching out with his consciousness, Aragon probed the length of the tunnel and several of the abandoned chamber chambers it opened to. A half dozen spiders and a sparse collection of moths, millipedes, and blind crickets were the only inhabitants. Hello, called Aragon and listened as the hall returned his voice to him with ever decreasing volume. Kvistor, said Aragon, looking at him. Does no one at all live in the ancient parts? Or in these ancient parts? The fresh-faced dwarf answered, Some do. A few strange Nurlin, those whom empty solitude is more pleasing than the touch of their wife's hand or the sound of their friends' voices. <laughs> what? Nothing. They'd just be, rather be alone than, like, having, like, a human contact. Like, I don't know. I mean, I get it, but at the same time, like, what a bunch of weirdos. What a bunch of weebs. It was one such Nurlag who warned us of the approach of the Urgal army, if you remember Arjitlam. Also, although we do not speak of it often, there are those who have broken the laws of our land, and whom their clan chiefs have banished on pain of death for a term of years, or, if the offense is severe, for the remainder of their lives. All such are as the walking dead to us. We shun them if we meet them outside of our lands, and hang them if we catch them within our borders. When Kvister had finished speaking, Aragon indicated that he was ready to leave. Kvister took the lead, and Aragon followed him out of the doorway through which they had entered, the three other dwarves close behind. They had gone no more than twenty feet when Aragon heard a faint scuffing from the rear. So faint, Kvister did not seem to notice. Aragon glanced back. By the amber light cast by the flameless lanterns mounted on either side of the passageway, he saw seven dwarves garbed entirely in black. Their faces masked with dark cloth and their feet shuffled, and their feet muffled with rags. Running toward his group with the speed that Aragon had assumed was the sole province of elves, shades, and other creatures whose blood hummed with magic. In their right hands, the dwarves held long, sharp daggers with pale blades that flicked with prismatic colors, while in their left, each carried a metal buckler with a sharpened spike protruding from the, bo protruding from the boss. Oh my god, it's the anti-Varden. Their minds, like those of the Razak, were hidden from Aragon. Sephira was Aragon's first thought. Then he remembered he was alone. Twisting to face the black-garbed dwarves, Aragon reached for the hilt of his falchion, while opening his mouth to shout a warning. He was too late. As the first word rang in his throat, three of the strange dwarves grabbed the, grabbed the hindmost of Aragon's guards and lifted their glimmering daggers to stab him. Faster than speech or conscious thought, Aragon plunged his whole being into the flow of magic, and without relying upon the ancient language to structure his spell, rewove the fabric of the world into a pattern more pleasing to him. The three guards who stood between him and the attackers flew toward him as if yanked by invisible strings and landed upon their feet beside him, unharmed but disoriented. Aragon winced at the sudden decrease in his strength. Two of the black garbed dwarves rushed to him, stabbing at his belly with their bloody, hungry daggers. Sword in hand, Aragon parried both blows, stunned by the dwarves' speed and ferocity. One of his guards, one of his guards, leapt forward, shouting and swinging his axe 
at the would-be assassins. Before Aragon could grab the dwarf's hauberk and yank him back to safety, a white blade writhing as with spectral flame pierced the dwarf's corded neck. As the door fell, Aragon glimpsed his con- Aragon glimpsed his contorted face and was shocked to see Kvistor, and that his throat was glowing molten red as it disintegrated around the dagger. I can't leave. I can't let them so much as scratch me, Aragon thought. Enraged by Kvistor's death, Aragon stabbed at his killer. So quickly, the black garbed dwarf had no opportunity opportunity to evade the blow and dropped lifeless at Aragon's feet. With all his strength, Aragon shaded, shouted, Stay behind me! Thin cracks split the floors and walls, and flakes of stone fell from the ceiling as his voice reverberated through the corridor. The attacking doors faltered at the unbridled power of his voice, then resumed their offensive. Aragon retreated several yards to give himself room to maneuver free of the corpses and settled into a low crouch, waving the falchion to and fro like a snake preparing to strike. <laughs> Just, like, the visual of him being, like, crouched down and being, like... I just imagine, like, fatty airsoft. I just imagine, like, airsoft fatty being, like... <laughs> with a lightsaber or some Hell shit. Yeah. <clears throat> the hallway was eight feet wide. Oh, wait. His heart was racing at twice its normal rate, and although the fight had just begun, he was already gasping for breath. You want, me, you want to see serious? <laughs> I'll show you serious! <laughs> the hallway was eight feet wide, which was wide enough for three of his six remaining enemies to attack him at once. They spread out, two attempting to flank him on the right and the left, while the third charged straight at him, slashing with frenzied speed at Aragon's arms and legs. Afraid, with the, afraid to duel with the dwarves as he would as if... Wait. Afraid to duel with the dwarves as he would have if they wielded normal blades... Aragon drove his legs against the floor and jumped up and forward. He spun halfway around and struck the ceiling feet first. He pushed off, spun halfway around again, and landed on, landed on his hands and feet a yard behind the three doors. Even as they whirled toward him, he stepped forward and beheaded the lot of them with a single backhand blow. Fine. I'll allow it. Whatever. Dude, that's pretty impressive. He fucking jumps onto the ceiling, essentially, and then jumps off like Spider-Man. Lands like Spider-Man. And then just Sing, slices their heads off as they're turning around. I just, I mean... I just imagine the imagery of that happening, like one dwarf turned around so fast that the momentum, like, carried his head, and so when he lopped it off, it was, like, whoosh, spinning off and, like, spun around on the ground. I know Aragon's not been in this specific scenario before for him to do something like this, but this just feels so out of control. Like, fantastical? Yeah. I know it's a fantasy. Everybody calm down. But like Yeah, everybody. <laughs> but like, you know what I'm saying? Like he just hasn't fought this fantastically before. It seems very like superhero action hero. He is a superhero. He's a writer. He's a fucking fantasy man. He's a fucking weeb. <laughs> <laughs> fantasy man. Uh, how fantasy anime. Man. That is pretty fucking anime. <laughs> The daggers clattered against the floor an instant before their heads. Leaping over the truncated bodies, Aragon twisted in midair and landed on the spot he had started from. He was not a moment too soon. A breath of wind tickled his neck as the tip of a dagger whipped past his throat. Another blade tug at the, tugged at the cuff of his leggings, cutting them open. He flinched and swung the falchion, trying, uh, trying to gain space to fight. My ward should have turned their blades away, he thought, bewildered. An involuntary cry escaped his throat as his foot struck a patch of slick blood and he lost his balance and toppled over backward. With a sickening crunch, his head collided with the stone floor. Blue lights flashed before his eyes. He gasped. His three remaining guards sprang over him and swung their axes in unison, clearing the air above Aragon and saving him from the bite of the flashing daggers. That was all the time Aragon needed to recover. He flipped up and berating himself for not trying this sooner shouted a spell laced with nine of the twelve death words Ormus had taught him. However, the moment after he loosed his magic, he abandoned the spell, for the black garb dwarves were protected by numerous wards. Given a few minutes, he might be able to evade or defeat the wards, but minutes might as well have been days in a battle such as theirs, where every second was as long as an hour. Having filled with magic, Aragon hardened his thoughts into an iron-hard spear and launched it at where the consciousness of one of the black guard dwarves ought to be. The spear skated off mental armor of a sort Aragon had not encountered before, smooth and seamless, seemingly unbroken by the con seemingly unbroken by the concerns 
natural to mortal creatures engaged in a struggle to death. Someone else is protecting them, Aragon realized. There are more behind this attack than just these seven. Okay. I know most bad people like to wear black because black is for bad people. Um, but, <laughs> but like, what if it's Galbatorix? What if he's like, you know, maybe get, getting in there to I all the I think they're just wearing people. black because it's like the color of assassins, shadows, doesn't reflect light. Hard, <laughs> hard to see. <laughs> Pivoting on one foot, Aragon lunged, fo lunged forward and with his falchion impaled his leftmost attacker in a knee, drawing blood. The dwarf stumbled and Aragon's guards converged upon him, grasping the dwarf's arm so he could not swing his dire blade and hacking at him with their curved axes. The nearest of the last two attackers raised his shield in anticipation of the blow Aragon was about to direct at him. Summoning the full measure of his might, Aragon cut at the shield, intending to shear it and the arm underneath it in half. As he had done with Zerok, in the fever of battle, though, he forgot to account for the dwarf's inexplicable speed. As the falchion neared its target, the dwarf tilted his shield so as to deflect the blow to the side. Two plumes of sparks erupted from the surface of the shield as the falchion glanced off the upper part and then the steel spike mounted in the center. Momentum carried the falchion further than Aragon had intended, and it continued flying through the air until it struck edge first against a wall, jarring Aragon's arm. With the crystalline sound, the blade of the falchion shattered into a dozen pieces, leaving him with a six-inch spike of jagged metal protruding from the hilt. That's got to be fucking strong. I feel like Aragon's going to die. Like when Auric made that comment, he's like, or you could die. <laughs> Way to fucking jinx him. Dismayed, Aragon dropped the broken sword and gripped the rim of the dwarf's buckler, wrestling with him back and forth and struggling to keep the shield between him and the dagger, graced with a halo of translucent colors. So it's an enchanted, like, poison dagger. I'm into that. The dwarf was incredibly tough. He matched Aragon's efforts and even succeeded in pushing him back a step. Releasing the buckler with his right hand but still holding on with his left, Aragon drew back his arm and struck the shield as hard as he could, punching through the tempered steel as easily as if it were made of rotten wood. Because of the calluses on his knuckles, he felt no pain from the impact. The force of the blow threw the dwarf against the opposite wall. His head lolling upon a boneless neck, the dwarf dropped to the ground like a puppet whose strings had been severed. Aragon pulled his hand back through the jagged hole in the shield, scratching himself on the torn metal, and drew his hunting knife. Then the last of the black garbed dwarves was upon him. Aragon parried his dagger twice, thrice, and then cut through the dwarf's padded sleeve and scored his dagger arm from the elbow to the wrist. The dwarf hissed with pain, blue eyes furious above his cloth mask. He initiated a series of blows, the dagger whistling through the air faster than the eye could follow, which forced Aragon to hop away to avoid the deadly edge. He's literally just going like, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then like Aragon just like backs up like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? The dwarf pressed the attack. For several yards, Aragon succeeded in evading him until his heel struck a body, and in attempting to step around it, he stumbled and fell against a wall, bruising his shoulder. With an evil laugh, the dwarf pounced. <laughs> I'm like a noween! Stabbing downward toward Aragon's exposed chest, throwing up an arm in a futile attempt to protect himself, Aragon rolled farther down the hallway, knowing that this time his luck had run out and he would not be able to escape. As he completed a revolution and his face was momentarily turned toward the dwarf again, Aragon glimpsed the pale dagger descending toward his flesh like a bolt of lightning from on high. Then, to his astonishment, the tip of the dagger caught on one of the flameless lanterns mounted on the wall. Wow, that's fucking lucky. Aragon whirled away before he could see more, but an <laughs> instant later, a burning, hot hand seemed to strive, strike him from behind, throwing him a good twenty feet through the hall until he fetched up against the edge of an open archway, instantly accumulating a new collection of scrapes and bruises. Ow. <laughs> oh, no. Ooh, bruises. You got a boo-boo. Like... I feel like that's implied that he would have scrapes and bruises being thrown about like that. Yeah. Like you don't, it seems, it almost like lessens the drama when you're like, oh, scrapes and bruises. Throwing him into the wall. Done. Yeah. Finique. Like, I get it. A booming report deafened him, feeling as if someone were driving splinters into his eardrums. Aragon clapped his hands over his ears and curled into a ball, howling. 
When the noise and the pain had subsided, he lowered his hands and staggered to his feet, clenching his teeth as his injuries announced their presence with a myriad of unpleasant sensations. Groggy and confused, he gazed upon the sight of the explosion. The blast had blackened a ten-foot length of the hallway with soot. Soft flakes of ash tumbled through the air, which was as which was as hot as the air from a heated forge. The dwarf who had been about to strike Aragon lay on the ground, thrashing, his body covered with burns. After a few more convulsions, he grew still. Aragon's three remaining guards lay at the edge of the suit, where the explosion had thrown them. Even as he watched, they staggered upright, blood dripping from their ears and gaping mouths, their beards singed and in disarray. The links along the fringe of their hauberks glowed red, but their leather underarmor seemed to have protected them from the worst of the heat. Aragon took a single step forward, and then stopped and groaned as a patch of agony bloomed between his shoulder blades. He tried to twist his arm around to feel the extent of the wound, but as the skin stretched, the pain became too great to continue. Nearly losing consciousness, he leaned against the wall for support. He glanced at the burnt dwarf again. I must have, sif I must have suffered similar injuries on my back. It's got, like, fucking charred up back. <clears throat> Forcing himself to concentrate, he recited two of the spells designed to heal burns that Brahm had taught him during their travels. As they took effect, it felt as if cool, soothing water were flowing across his back. He sighed with relief and straightened. Are you hurt? He asked as the, his guards hobbled over. <laughs> They're bleeding from their fucking ears. Are you hurt? <laughs> the lead dwarf frowned, tapped his right ear, and shook his head. Aragon muttered a curse, and only then did he notice he could not hear his own voice. Again, drawing upon the reserves of energy within his body, he cast a spell to repair the inner mechanisms of the ears and of theirs. As the incantation concluded, an irritating itch squirmed inside his ears, then faded along with the spell. Are you hurt? The dwarf on the right, a burly fellow with a forked beard, coughed and spout out a glob of congealed blood, then growled. Nothing that time won't mend. What of you, Shade Slayer? I'll live. I feel like Aragon is specifically adept at healing spells. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, that's like the only thing I feel like he's like particularly talented at. Like his other spells, like sure, like they're fine. Like they he's work. He's like a good healer, you know, like <laughs> yeah. he pulls people out of harm's way and he like protects people. So he's like kind of tanky, I guess. But for the most part, he's like, why is a hail on everybody and everybody gets healed. He's like a, like a druid. A tank if need be, but probably better at healing. Paladin. Nice. That's cute. Fucking nerd. <laughs> Testing the floor with every step, Aragon entered the suit-blackened area and knelt beside Kavistor, hoping that he might still save the door from the clutches of death. As soon as he beheld Kavistor's wound again, he knew it was not to be. Aragon bowed his head, the memory of recent and former bloodshed bitter to his soul. He stood... Why did the lantern explode? They are filled with heat and light, Argent Long. One of his guards replied, If they are broken, all of it escapes at once, and then it gets better to be... F and then it's... All of it escapes at once, and then it is better to be far away. Gesturing at the crumpled corpses of their attackers, Aragon asked, Do you know of which clan they are? The dwarf with the forked beard rifled through the clothes of several of the black-garbed dwarves, and then said, Barzul! They carry no marks upon them, such as you would recognize, Arjit Lam. But they carry this. He held up a bracelet made of braided horse hair set with polished cabochons of amethyst. Cabochons or cabochons? I think it's cabochon. Cabochon? I think it's French. Probably. JD, help us. <laughs> I feel like he's told us how to pronounce it before, but it's French and I'm American, so I can't figure it out. I never will. <laughs> What does it mean? This amethyst, said the dwarf, and tapped one of his, one of the cabochons <laughs> with a suit-streaked fingernail. This particular variety of amethyst, it only grows, or it grows in only four parts of the Bjor Mountains, and three of them belong to the Asphalt and Rack Anhuin. Aragon ground. Ground? What the fuck? Aragon frowned. Grimst Borth Vermund ordered this attack. I cannot say for sure, Arjitlam. Another clan might have the bracelet for, or the, another clan might have left the bracelet for us to find. They might want us to think it was as Weldenrak and who, and so we do not realize who our foes really are. But if I had to wager, Arjitlam, I would wager a cartload of gold that it is as Weldenrak and who, and is responsible. 
Blast them, Aragon murmured. Whoever it was, blast them. He clenched his fist to stop them from shaking. With the sides of his boot, he nudged one of the prismatic daggers the assassins had wielded. The spells on these weapons, and on the on the men, he motioned with his chin. Men, dwarves, be it be as it may, they must have required an incredible amount of energy, and I cannot even imagine how complex their wording was. Casting them would have been hard and dangerous. Aragon looked at each of his guards in turn and said, As you are as you are my witness, I swear I shall not let this attack, nor Cavister's death go unpunished. Whichever clan or clan sent these dung-faced killers, when I learn their names, they will wish they had never thought to strike at me, and by striking at me, strike at Der Gremston Jedum. This I swear to you as a dragon rider and a fellow member of Der Gremston Jedum. And if any of you, and if any ask you of it, repeat my promise to them, as I have given it to you. Shit. The dwarves bowed before him. And he with the forked beard replied, As you command, so we shall obey, Arjitlam. You honor Hrothgar's memory by your words. Then another of the dwarves said, Whichever clan it was, they have vi violated the law of hospitality. They have attacked a guest. They are not even so high as rats. They are men, Nerlin. He spat on the floor, and the other, other dwarves spat with him. Aragon walked, to the, Aragon walked to where the remains of his falchion lay. He knelt in the suit, and with the tip of a finger touched one of the pieces of metal, tracing its ragged edges. It, I must have hit the shield in the wall so hard I overwhelmed... <laughs> I must have hit the shield in the wall so hard I overwhelmed the spells I used to reinforce the steel, he thought. Then he thought, I need a sword. Oh my god. I need a rider's sword. Okay, this motherfucker has said, I need a sword more fucking times. Well, he thought he found one. I'm just saying, all he keeps saying is, I need a sword. You know you need a rider's sword. You've known this the whole time. Guess what the next chapter is? It's not a Roran chapter. It's an Oswata chapter, probably. Not an Oswata chapter. It's not a Murtai chapter, because we don't Not get an one. Aragon chapter. Stop. Don't tease me. I'm Who not lying. It? And it's and it's called A Matter of Perspective. Did you lie to me this whole time and it's actually a Murtag chapter and then we get one and then that then oh do you ever have a dream? I don't know, dude. You have to wait till the next time to find out. But it's not Roran, Nasawada, Aragon. It's not gonna be Murtag. It's gonna be someone fucking uh Guess names and I'll tell you yes or no. Um Nars, 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 Nargars, Nars, Gars, Varg. No. Um, King Orin. No. Um, a clan man that sliced his arms up. Nope. Um, Fodawar. That, yeah, that guy, Farquad. <laughs> Farquad. Um,. Oh my fucking god, the redhead. What's her name? <laughs> Katrina. No. He said it's not Roran? Yeah, it's not Roran. It can't be Murtag. Is it Murtag? It might be. Stop. I'll fucking scream. <laughs> <clears throat> Stop. It's not. <sighs> Why would you do that to me? It's fun. Who is it then? Mm. <laughs> God. <laughs> Safira. Oh. Wow. I mean, okay, listen. You got my hopes up, making it feel like it was going to be Muratag. Yeah. Hell yeah. So you could have said any, you could have said a Brahm chapter, and I still would have been pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't guess Safira. I was expecting you to guess it like a me and be like, Safira. But you don't even think about her. You don't even give a shit about Safira. I, I just, okay, it was a matter of perspective. So I was thinking, you just view her as a stupid listen. beast. <laughs> I just feel like when you put the word perspective in there, then I think of like, oh, perspective. Someone who has a different perspective than Aragon, which sometimes is Safira, but for the most part, they're pretty like the same. So it made me feel like it was <clears> someone else. Still think a Murtag chapter would be interesting. Oh my god. So, fucking Aragon almost got fucking dead. Dude, he almost got he's super so, dead. He's so lucky. He's like almost luckier than Harry fucking Potter. 
Like, holy shit. Like, think about it. And then his guards were kind of just like, oh. Yeah, what were they doing? Fucking standing there with their fucking dicks in their hands. They're against him, too. I was wondering that if, like, maybe, like, they were part of the deal and so they weren't really, like, doing anything. Because what if it's Galbatorix that's, like, you know, getting in there? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because the dwarves would totally work with Galbatorix. I don't know if you're being sarcastic or not right now. I don't think any dwarf would ever work with Galbatorix, no matter what. You don't think so? No. Okay. They'll hit Galbatorix. Yeah, well, <clears throat> so does Murtag. They almost don't even want to... They don't, almost don't even want to help the Varden because of Galbatorix. I know it's in... Or maybe those dwarves that are saying we shouldn't help the Varden are because they're working for Galbatorix. Dude, I'm just saying that, like, he's got magic and probably charisma because nobody rises in power like that without charisma. So, like, what if he just charisma those dwarves into following him and he's like, yo, dude, like, you have the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And they're like, you're right. And he's like, I'll let you guys keep Farthendor. I just want Serta. And they're like... And he's like, think about it. A dwarf has never been a writer. You know? I'm not going to come and take your land. I don't care about the mountains. You guys can do whatever the fuck you guys want. Just don't try to rise up against me because I'll squash you. And they're like, that's a pretty good deal. He was like, you have this human coming in here trying to be a dwarf like what's up with that that's kind of weird like that's kind of like he's a dweeb <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I just feel like it's suspicious and they're like ooh it could be in Zaraka in Atifa or whatever they're calling him and Antifa then, <laughs> <laughs> like fucking whatever and then um, like maybe it's just a trick and they're not really part of the veil people Right, that's the ones, the Veil people, the purple people leaders? Purple people leaders, yep. Okay. 100%. Because maybe it's a trick, and they're not really the purple people leaders. Fuck, you know, when you say it like that, it's a very compelling argument. And then fucking or- Orin, Orik, totally jinxed him when he was like, you could just die. <laughs> what if Orik <gasps> orchestrated, orchestrated it? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. What if he wants Aragon to die? No. I don't believe it. Well, I don't know. Those dwarves are kind What if of they made shit. Aragon king of the dwarves? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be For wild? For some reason, all I could think of was Labyrinth and like David Bowie. You remind me of the babe. <laughs> <laughs> um, what the fuck is going to happen now? Aragorn almost got dead, and he didn't even have Saphira. Like, that's really suspicious that, like, he showed up there without Saphira. And they were like, hmm. Hmm. It was almost like it was planned or something. Nasawad is in on it, too. Dude, they're all in on it. Aragorn's alone. All by himself. Even the the elves are against (laughs) him. He's just too lucky to kill. They keep trying, but... (laughs) The boy who was really, really lucky. Like, a dwarf was, like, going to stab him and then just, like, hit a lantern instead. That doesn't even, like, almost make sense. Well, I think he was, like, <laughs> like through the air. Like, jumping <laughs> and, like, leaping through the air and coming down. And I think oh, it, like, no. got caught on the lantern. At least that's how I was imagining it. I always think, like, of the lanterns in the walls. But I guess they're probably in the ceiling. Well, even so if it was on the sense. wall, he could still. Yeah, I think it makes more sense if it's, like, a hanging lantern or something. And then mm-hmm. he, like, or even hanging from the wall. Yeah. Fuck. He like, wow. He almost got dead. Again, almost got dead. Like that close. Within a fucking inch of his life, dude. A few times in just that fight, like the dagger was like. Yeah. Damn. And then his friend, his little guard friend is dead. Kavistor. Yeah. Rip. Rip Kavistor. We should have like a death wall. All the named dead people. Oh God. (laughs) 
<laughs> Fred would be up there. <laughs> <laughs> That's too much for me as a person in my heart. Tonks and Lupin. Don't. Don't. Don't do it. Ooh, getting Stop. teary-eyed. Well, I'm too everyone, <laughs> thank you so much for watching. If you guys like the episode, hit that thumbs up button. 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 The like button. The thumbs up button. And um, subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you in the next one. It's really grossing me out. Yeah, what doesn't gross you out? <sighs> I don't know. Everything grosses me out. Sunshine, mm. daisy, butter, mellow. Turn this stupid fat rat yellow. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know. Do you get it? I don't get anything. <laughs>